Uh, perfect. Hi, everyone. I hope um, everybody had an opportunity to get some coffee um, this morning or uh, some coffee this afternoon. It also works. Again, thank you, Adam, for the intro. My name is Diogo Monica. I'm the security lead at Docker. Um, and today, we're going to talk a little bit about Docker 110 security improvements. <clears throat> okay, before we go into it, though, I would like to talk a little bit generically about uh, what we're going to cover. So today, I'm going to show you um, the normal security functionality that Docker provides in terms of isolation and how Docker actually leverages things that are already in the kernel to provide isolation between your containers. In particular, I'm going to show you how, by default, Docker does provide an additional layer of isolation, therefore making your infrastructure safer by default. I'm also going to take a look at new security features specifically that are coming out with Docker 110. And finally, I'm going to finish by showing you a demo of creating a simple SecCom policy, and then we're going to play with that a little bit. So under the hood, containers are essentially, um, containers allow you to have isolation between processes by providing access to lower level capabilities of your Linux kernel. In particular, um, there are three things that uh, actually are uh, important, uh, particularly on, um, are important under the hood. One of them is namespaces. So namespaces are essentially in the Linux kernel and allow you to have a segregated uh, view of exactly what is happening inside of the system. We also have capabilities that allows you to segregate what root does, and finally, C groups. So let's go individually into these specifics. So under the hood, namespaces are going to provide you an isolated view of the system. What this means is that when you run Docker, when you're executing anything inside of a Docker container, you essentially have a namespace, IPC, network, mount, fit namespace, etc. For example, I have on the slide, if I do run an Ubuntu container and I create a shell inside of it, by doing PS, you're going to see that you're only going to see the processes that are inside of this container. In this case, the shell itself and the PS command executing. Why is this? This is because the PID namespace is operating and is essentially separating all my processes of the container from the processes of the host. So normally you'd see the process of the host, but since your namespace, you won't. Additionally, we also make use of cgroups for security. Cgroups is a kernel feature that actually limits and isolates the resource usage of a collection of processes. In this case, we use it such that we have the capacity of limiting CPU, memory, I.O., network, et cetera. So by using cgroups, you can make sure that a container does not use up all the resources of your host or of your virtual machine, and you can have multi-tenant containers that are actually living happily along each other. And finally, I wanted to mention capabilities. Capabilities is a way where the root user in a Unix system usually is the all-powerful user and essentially has the ability of doing anything. However, in Linux, you have capabilities, which actually divides the privileges that root has into these distinct units. For example, you have a capability to allow you to do um, shown, you have a capability to allow, allow you to do bind, set UID, etc. With Docker, you actually get to individually select which capabilities you want your container to have. So even if there is a user inside of the container that is running as root, you can drop capabilities altogether. In this slide, and as an example, I'm running Docker with an Alpine shell, and I'm dropping the shown capability. And then you can see that if I try to change the ownership of the file, I'm going to get an error saying operation not permitted. So this is interesting because you can really lock down the capabilities of your root inside of the container by dropping, for example, all capabilities, which you can do by doing cap drop all. And finally, on the, on the, on the features that we use in terms of uh, a process restriction, I would point out that these capabilities, by default, come dropped. You have inside of a Docker container less than half of the capabilities that root has. And this obviously reduces the impact of a compromise of a container or reduces the impact of arbitrary code execution inside of your application inside of a container because not all of these capabilities are available out of the box. Okay, so this is a high level view of how Docker containers actually use the Linux 
capabilities, namespaces, and C groups to provide isolation. But what is new in Docker 110 specifically? Well, Docker 110, we've been doing a ton of work. In particular, one of the things that Docker 110 comes on master, and this was a feature that was pre previously experimental on Docker 1.9, is user namespaces. So I mentioned what namespaces were. Namespaces allow a series of different things, such as such as um, such as um, PIDs, right? In particular, user namespaces is another feature of namespaces that allows you to separate and have a per namespace mapping of users and group IDs. So essentially what this allows us to do for Docker specifically is that if a process inside of a namespace can be different than a process outside of the namespace, then what we can do is we can have UID zero, the UID of the user root, not match the user root outside of the container. I think the best description of username spaces and why are they important came from Michael, quote from Michael Karish, in which he said, a process can have a non-zero user ID outside of a namespace, while at the same time having user ID of zero inside of the namespace. In other words, the process is unprivileged for operations outside of the user namespace, but has root privileges inside of the namespace. And the reason why this is so powerful is because we know that, we all know that you should not run things as root. Just because you're running inside of a container doesn't mean that you should ignore 15 years of Unix best practices around security. However, users are lazy or they need root for one reason or the other. And so sometimes they actually end up actually using, um, actually using root inside of the container. And in those cases, this is where user spaces come in. You can set a setting on the Docker daemon saying that all the UID zeros inside of the containers don't actually match root outside of the container. And this essentially allows you to be safe. And in the case of a compromise or in the case of remote code execution or in case of a user with a shell, root inside of the container will no longer mean root outside of the container. This is great. And it's ready on Docker 110 and it's essentially merged into master and you can make use of it right now. So that is username spaces. What else did we get into Docker 110? Another thing that I'm really excited for Docker 110 is our authorization plugin. Our authorization plugins essentially allow you to have a piece of code that individually decides the execution of every single API call that goes to the engine. What this allows you to do is you can have granular access policies for managing access to the daemon. And this allows you to have, for example, multi-tenant environments. In particular, I have a simple example of what an authorization plugin can do. Imagine that you're running a Docker daemon and you have it exposed and available to your developers. However, you don't want any of your developers to be able to run a privileged container. Why? Because a privileged container essentially gives all the capabilities and the ability of a user to essentially have root on the host, and you don't want this. Therefore, you can create an authorization plugin. In using these plugins, you can essentially deny every single run operation that includes privileged. So in the image on the right, you can see that the user would essentially try to run docker run dash it dash dash privileged an sh shell inside of an alpine container that would go to the daemon. The daemon would communicate with a plugin and the plugin would say yes or no. You're authorized or you're not authorized. So that is really interesting because this allows you to essentially have very granular permissions around who can execute what. For example, plugins that are available today allow you to essentially not restrict all mounted volumes from users. Users are not able to mount volumes. I've done one myself that allows you to reject privilege but you can do arbitrary things because you get to choose at a granular level every single API call, whether it should go and should be executed or not. Additionally, another interesting thing about authorization plugins is that you can also filter the results that come from the daemon to the user. So imagine that you want to allow a user to run Docker PS to see what containers are actually running. However, you don't want the user to see all of the containers that are running on the Docker daemon. You want the user to see only the containers that he owns or that he has access to. With Auth plugins, the answer 
actually goes back to the plugin and the plugin has the opportunity of filtering the results before they get sent onto the user. And therefore, you could actually filter all the processes and all the containers that the user sees. So this is just a high level of how Odyssey plugins can be useful. And I bet all of you will come up with way better ideas and very interesting plugins in the near future. Another capability or another feature that we added for Docker 110 that I'm incredibly excited about and the one that I'm gonna be demoing today is called SecComp filtering support. So what is SecComp and what is SecComp filtering? So SecComp has existed for a long time. And it essentially allows you to do um, BPF policy style, a Berkeley packet filter style policy around system calls that your container is allowed to execute. What this means is that if your container runs an application and the application needs to make some syscall, it will essentially have to obey to this policy. This policy allows you to have several actions, such as should I allow a syscall, deny it, trap to trace it later, uh, kill, um, et cetera. And you can actually filter based on the arguments that are being passed to the syscall. So I have an example on the right. Imagine that you have a container and you add the simple JSON as a policy. This policy is the system call nano sleep will have an action, a seccomp action error. What this means is that every time this container attempts to do sleep and call the syscall a nano sleep, it will be rejected with an error and the container won't be able to do it. And we're gonna see a demo of this further on. This is a very simple demo, but you can see how this is powerful. There are 325, around 325 system calls in the Linux kernel. They're essentially one of the most granular level ways that you can to control any process or any application from executing. If you have the capability of individually saying which system calls should execute and which system calls should not, you essentially have the ability of controlling the kernel surface of exposure that a container presents to code executing inside of it. In particular, I mentioned that we have 325 policies. However, giving you this capability is not useful on its own. Developers are not known for using complex things and creating very thorough security policies and making sure that their containers are secure. So we went further and we said, if we are to support SecCom filtering, then we should provide a same default SecCom profile. And everybody that is running Docker 110 should essentially have the security benefits of running this. So that's exactly what we did. Docker 110 ships with the Docker security SecCom profile by default. Actually, it blocks 54 system calls that are not needed or are too dangerous. We're currently using a blacklist model, but as we evolve, we would like to turn this into a full whitelist model. And essentially, as more people test this out and more people are using it, we can further tighten it down the default policy. So now you're asking, so how is this useful? And I have a con very concrete answer for you. Do you remember the CVE around queuing um, local escalation on Linux a few weeks back? I have the CVE 2016-0728. This vulnerability essentially allowed you, if you were able to call key CTL system call, to escalate privileges to root. But funny enough, on Docker 110, this does not work. Code running inside of your container trying to exploit this vulnerability would not work by default on Docker 110 because we block the key CTL system call. So this is a very practical example and a very real example of how Docker 110 has already made your infrastructure more secure. People that were running Docker 110 do not have to worry as much about patching their kernels and about immediately updating because they knew they were protected against this particular issue. And as time goes on, you are going to see more and more of this. You're going to see individual security policies for individual container images. You're gonna see the default policy become timed down. By default, Docker is gonna be the best sandbox that you have available in the market. Finally, I wanna talk about something that is coming on Docker 111 that we just barely missed it for Docker 110. 
One thing that is interesting and that people use Docker for is essentially allowing people to have remote shells, to learn how to program, or to execute code and do some sandboxing uh, online where they play with a Unix system. However, whenever you give somebody a shell, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to fork bomb it. I think we all, as system administrators, have seen that before. So finally, as of Linux kernel 4.3, there is actually a PID control group that was added that limits the number number of processes that can be forked inside of a C group. So we essentially turned it on on Docker, and you turned it by default. So on Docker 1.11, as soon as the PR gets merged, you're going to be able to simply execute a shell and know that no fork bombs will be able to take down your system because the C group, PID control group, will be protecting you and will have an upper limit of what you can do. So this is fantastic for people that are essentially allowing other people execute Docker containers and run free and essentially execute every single permission that you can have on the, on the Linux system. So as you can see, Docker has a very, very advanced set of capabilities. One way that you can say is, one, one way that you can describe running applications inside of Docker or you can have an analogy is, why would you run an application directly on bare metal or directly on a virtual machine if you can run it directly inside of a Docker container and have a sandbox. And this question can be asked as, why would you use Internet Explorer 6? Why would you have this non, this privileged executing application with no restrictions around it when you can actually use Chrome? This is the transition that is happening. This is where Docker is headed. Docker is essentially Chrome. It is a very powerful sandbox around your applications, which is what you want to protect in terms of security. Perfect. So now I would like to show you a demo of SecComp working in practice. I'm get out of this. I'm going to go to my console. Okay. So now I'm in my console. I hope everybody can see this. Okay. So I'm running Docker 110. And this is essentially the version that um, is, um, is, is off of master right now. And in Docker 110, as you know, we now have SecComp capabilities. So I showed you a very simple uh, SecComp profile, but I would like to show you in practice how SecComp can actually be used. So let me show you a socket.json policy that I have. In this case, I'm actually going to edit the socket.json and create the simplest possible that I can. So this is going to be this is going to be a policy that. The default action is going to be allow, but is essentially going to deny cat. Whoops, I screwed up my JSON. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay, so let's use this flip example. If we go and see what this policy actually does, sleep.json, it's essentially saying that the default action is an action of allow. And then this was the exact the example that I gave you on the slides. You have a system call, and if the system call is nano sleep, then the action for seccomp is going to be error out. What this means is that if I run a container with this policy, I will not be able to execute the system call nano sleep. So before I do that, let's actually run um, a container without the second policy. So I'm going to run a Docker container with Alpine in SH. I do this, and now I have a shell. So now, as I would normally execute, I have a sleep command. And the sleep command takes an argument, for example, three seconds, and you're going to see that it's actually sleeping for three seconds right now. One, two, three, we can try that again. You can see that it takes three seconds for the command to return. Okay, that's great. It's working as expected. However, what if I actually add a second policy, sleep.json, uh, to it? The way that I add a second policy in Docker is by adding the security option, seccomp, and providing the path to the JSON file that defines this policy. You can see in my screen that this policy has a default allow, so all the system calls will be all allowed, and only the system call nano sleep will be rejected. So let's try this out. If I run this, you can see that container in Alpine still runs, but now if I try to do sleep, and let's try to do sleep for a long period of time, 10 seconds, 
you're going to see that nothing happens. And the reason why nothing happens is because the system call is being denied. And therefore, sleep does not actually get to execute nano sleep, and therefore does not get to execute at all. So this is really interesting. So we have a default policy right now that is an allow, and then we have a blacklist of, um, of, um, of system calls that, that we want to execute. To show you that we can actually change the policy to something that is not as useful, for example, instead of allow, I'm going to put the default policy as error none. So now what is going to happen is every single system call should be rejected. So what are we expecting if I run the security uh, second profile sleep.json now? Well, we're expecting this not to actually work at all. And there we go. So we can't start the container uh, because we have a default policy that is denied. So now let's look at a more complex example. I have a busy box JSON um, policy. And in this policy, I actually did something that you might want to do on the most secure containers that you want to execute. Essentially, I turned what is essentially a blacklist on my sleep.json policy into a whitelist. And the way that I did that is I have a default action that is erroring, but then every single system call that I want to execute, I have it explicitly stated out on my syscall list. You can see that I'm allowing read, I'm allowing nano sleep, I'm allowing write, I'm allowing open, close, etc. So let's try to run this. I'm going to run busybox, and essentially I'm going to provide this profile and try to get a shell. Okay, so this didn't actually work. Let me look at my policy, see what is actually happening. The default action is error out, and then we have allow. Okay, I don't see anything wrong with this. The demo gods are not being nice to me today. Anyway, the point is you can actually have a very specific policy that allows you to very concretely define all the system calls that you can execute and that you should not be able to execute. And system sleep might not seem like an actual uh, policy or an actual call that is useful, but let's modify our sleep JSON, and instead of denying nano sleep, let's actually deny something more useful. Let's deny socket. So now, if I run the exact same container as before, I'm going to be able, with the same second policy, I'm going to be able to sleep. Oh. Actually, I have to change it back to allow by default. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to be allowed to sleep now. You can see that sleep executes because you changed that syscall. But now, if I try to do a netcat and I try to listen on a port, I'll get rejected. So this is a very concrete example of how you can have something useful on a second policy. Because note that we could actually make a second policy that does not just reject socket. It would reject socket on a specific port. And so you could only bind on, for example, port 80, or you could only bind on port 443, and no attacker could actually have a listening netcat or a listening shell. And again, remember that even though this particular policy is um, blacklist, you can have a whitelist policy equally easy. Perfect. So that finishes our demo. And now I would love to answer some questions that anybody has. Okay, so our first question comes from Dan. And Dan's question is, are there any restrictions on the OS, on the host OS for any of these capabilities in 110? His question is, can I run this on older kernels? So the answer to that is you should always run an updated kernel, but yes, you are able to run seccomp on older kernels. There are some bugs um, that I remember on the, the, the one three or in older kernels, but you should be able to actually infer um, by the release notes of the set comp on 110 uh, what kernels are actually supported. I remember that we had some bugs that we had to um, tweak and some things that we had to change, but the reality is that um, some of these capabilities are bleeding edge. In particular, for example, the C group um, PID for forking that comes on Docker 111, you'll only be able to use it on kernel 4.3. Another question comes from Nickel. Is there a way to control the second policy and the Docker daemon level such that it cannot be overrode at runtime? So that is a great question. So the second policies right now 
are by default set. So you have a default set com policy that every container gets applied to. And yes, if you want to disable it, you can actually run seccomp unconfined. So I could actually show you that I can go back to my demo, clear this out, and if I run unconfined, I could actually show you that I get to execute anything. So this would essentially be unconfined, and this is how you define a seccomp policy that runs with that. And your question is, how can I, at runtime, make sure that people do not run a seccomp unconfined or provide their own policies? And the answer to that is the seccomp, is the authorization plugins that I mentioned. So if you see the authorization plugins, you actually, instead of saying in this case that I have on the slide, if it's dash dash privileged, you can actually say if it's security options, reject running this container. Or specifically, if it's a security option around seccomp, do not allow it to run because I don't want to be, I, want to, I don't want to be overwritten in terms of security policies. So that is the answer. As an authorization plugin, you can do that. Another question comes from Alexandro. Can rules be mapped to Docker clusters using Swarm? So right now, uh, Swarm uses the daemon as um, a remote API, and Swarm itself represents essentially a meta API that represents all the containers. Swarm itself doesn't know a lot about security comp computation and seccomp policies at all. So you will have the be default behavior that you have on Docker. So the fact that it's a Docker cluster doesn't affect and doesn't change the way that Docker works. Um, another question from Farhad is, is it not possible to deny and allow some features? So the features are all immediately in Docker. And one of the things that for Docker security we believe in is secure by default. Your Docker containers should be secure by default. And that's why we ship with default SE Linux policies, less than half of the capabilities dropped, and now obviously a secure computation profile that denies dangerous syscalls. However, you cannot use these features, or you can individually disable them. Yes. Another, questions, another question from Rory, are there plans to enable username space as a default option? At the moment, I think it's present, but not enabled by default. Yes. So right now, it is not enabled by default. Unfortunately, there's a lot of, um, a lot of applications in people that are running containers where they actually did it in a way and designed it in a bad way where they actually require real root. And so right now, we're trying to have it as a capability that people can enable and that we rec strongly recommend them to enable such that when they merge or when they port all of their applications to a model where it can't run inside of a user namespace, then finally we can later on turn it on by default. And obviously the path is to turn every security feature on by default and to have people create exceptions if they want to do something dangerous. In terms of, uh, there's the question, um, from CAN, is there a way to see the logs for denied syscalls, which container called them? So these operations can absolutely be logged on the Docker daemon side, yes. And in SecComp, you actually get to call some options uh, that are essentially pass-throughs, like the trace one, where you can do operations such as log. So you get to actually have some insight into how your containers are actually behaving. Um, there's um, a question from Adam. I'm a bit confused on the difference between SecComp and capabilities. They both seem to limit what a process can do. I mean, at a meta level, everything that we're doing is limiting what a process can do inside of a container. They're just doing it at different granularities and different levels. You can think of capabilities as essentially an aggregation of individual syscalls because that's somewhat what they do, but it's more of a meta level. And you can think of it as multiple layers of security. Imagine that for some reason the second policy gets disabled. Now you have the capabilities to actually reduce the, uh, the impact of root. So this is a multi-layered approach, even though they are obviously overlapping and they're essentially protecting against um, confined behavior, obviously. Um, there's a question from Angelica. Uh, can you please clarify the difference between using auth plugin and second policies? So a second policy specifically allows you to deny or allow specific system calls, which is one of the lowest levels that you can have of an application interacting with your OS-based system. An OS plugin essentially allows you to do arbitrary operations. If I want someone not to be able to run a command, such as docker run dash dash privilege, or with some particular param parameter, I can deny that on an OS plugin. 
An OTC plugin will see every sim single API call and will be able to return a yes or a no, should this be executed by the daemon or not executed by the daemon. So, second policies allow to limit the behavior of a container, and authorization plugins allow you to do arbitrary things, essentially creation of granular access profiles for managing access to the daemon, allow you essentially to have a multi-tenant setting. So another question, Docker 110 ships with a sample second policies. We do have the default second policy, yes. Um, we do not have necessarily sample second policies, but as time goes on, we will be creating for our official images second policies that we believe are the best way of running them. So as time goes on, we'll have more and more examples so you can use. Um, more questions? Okay, so there's a question from Caesar. I've been curious about network security on Docker. Will it be possible to sniff at some point packets within the containers? So yes, you can actually, if, I mean, there's several ways of doing this. If you do run with that net, dash, 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 dash net host, means that your containers will be participating on your host networking, and so sniffing on any of those interfaces will allow you to sniff all the packets in and out of all containers. But you can also sniff on the particular interfaces for Docker containers, and you could have a sister container that has dash dash privilege or has the ability of uh, doing DPI. I'm not a personal believer in network inspection in DPI, but if you want, you can actually do it. 